independent counsel hearings in person. You tuned into our televised proceedings on Channel 13. Now, you have the chance to listen to us on the radio as we demystify our work and the people who do it. This is not a counsel hearing. This is Hearing the Counsel with your host, Josh Gibson. Thank you, deep voice person with a funky backbeat. Indeed, this is not a council hearing, this is hearing the council. You can't have a government without a council, so you can't have a government radio station without a council show. This is it. I'm Josh Gibson, Director of Communications for the Council. You might also know me as the council's voice on social media at Council of DC. Uh, and today we are back with one of our more frequent guests, uh, council member at large, Robert White. Thanks for uh, coming back again, council member. Appreciate it. Always glad to join, Josh. Thanks for having me back. Oh, no problem. Uh, so a lot of times we start with the serious and then we end with something silly. This time we're, we're flipping the script a little bit. We're going to start with a little something silly uh, because I was noticing a couple weeks ago uh, on your personal uh, Instagram that you had gone on a kids free beach getaway uh, with your wife. <laughs> and uh, people were openly speculating uh, in the comments on your uh, fitness routine. Um, so I think that raises the question everyone's been asking, why is no one speculating about my fitness routine? Because <laughs> no one ever speculated about that. Only because you haven't posted the beach pictures yet, that's all. Uh, well, yeah, that was, that was a service to the community. Um, but uh, yeah, but anyway, so I mean, it's... Uh, isn't it a little strange to be that folks kind of a know about you're on you're on this uh, kids free getaway and also folks are wanting to know about your fitness regimen? How how does how does that make you feel? Did you did the you a ten years ago think you'd ever be in that situation? <laughs> I, I I didn't. I I I uh, sort of you know exercised since I was young, uh, but nobody ever paid attention or, or cared much. And and I uh, think between COVID, you know really dressing more casually more more often um and then you know a, 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 a photo of uh, being in at the beach with with my wife post-election uh people started paying attention a little a little odd uh you know space for me but uh but but it's all right i'm i'm 40 these might be my last couple years where anybody cares so <laughs> I'll, I'll take it while i can get it so just just for the inquiring minds that want to know, so are you a weights guy? Are you an aerobics guy? Are you a basketball running? What's your what's your deal? Yeah, I uh, I I I really don't like cardio other than biking. So so biking is is really the only cardio I do. Uh, but I enjoy lifting, and I, I've done it since I was young, and uh, you know, sort of changed my workout routines over the years. Uh, and just to make sure anybody who you know are incentivized to to listen to to your show. Yeah, I'll tell people here what what routine I use so that they have to come to your show to, to find it out. Uh, but just before the pandemic, I don't know how it happened upon this, but I found out um, about a, a, a workout routine that Arnold Schwarzenegger started doing when he started bodybuilding and he swore by it. He still swears by it. It's called the Golden Six. Um, and so instead of really kind of like isolation muscle movements, you do a number of compound exercises, but I do fewer exercises now, uh, about an hour a day, tremendously better uh, results. So I, I, I encourage people to, to just look up Arnold Schwarzenegger, Golden Six. You might have to make a couple modifications here and there, but relatively simple workout routine. And it, it more or less is what I use in addition to uh, some, some biking cardio and a lot of knocking on doors. That helps too. And are you a home-based guy or are you a gym-based guy? So if, if home-based for two reasons. One, I have young kids, so I either have time to travel to a gym or to work out. I don't have time to do both. Um, and, and so just before COVID, I started getting used exercise equipment off of Craigslist for virtually for free. Shout out to my friend Ryan, who helped me get most of it um, and uh, just, you know, assembled some, some stuff in my basement. Um, I'm also oddly for what I do professionally. I'm a pretty quiet guy. So when I go to the gym, I, I really didn't talk to people anyway. I just kind of focus on exercising and, and go back home. Uh, so having a home gym is, is, is frankly practical, but also fits my personality a bit more. And I know people like you make people like me crazy because I know you're busier than me. 
Um, you know, you got young kids, you've got a crazy 24 seven job, but you still manage to find uh, time for fitness. I don't know how you do that, but uh, yeah. just try, try to maintain balance and in, in the long term, it's it, it is tough. It requires me to get up uh, pretty early. I, I, I woke up at five before the pandemic. The pandemic made me realize I just I need to give myself 30 more minutes. So I, I get up at 530 now and I, I work out uh, pretty early in the morning before my, my girls wake up. But but it's balanced with mental health uh, focuses as well. I try to be balanced in my exercise, my diet and, and also my mental health. And that's a place just like physical health where I try to get better and better. So uh, over the past couple of years, I found time to meditate uh, just for 20 minutes in, in the morning, and, and it helps substantially. Uh, I do a lot of focus on, on mental health. I'm a very strong believer uh, in therapy. I think there, there are two kinds of people in this world, folks uh, who, who know they need therapy and folks who need therapy but don't know it. Uh, but, but we all need uh, mental health help just like we need physical health help. Now, I mean, on the, on the mental health front, let's talk about that. The reason you need a getaway was because without naming them, you were not running just one job, you were doing two jobs for a, a number of months. Um, and uh, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with throwing yourself into not just one 24 seven job, but two 24 seven jobs? And then spoiler alert, uh, it not coming out the way you wanted it to end. Yeah. How do you deal with that? From a mental health standpoint, that is a challenge. Great question. It, it is a challenge. Um, you know, a couple <clears throat> couple things, underlying philosophies. Uh, one and the, the most important one, and this is really how I, I deal with with, with a, a loss and in, in a campaign that I, I work really hard on is I, I do have an underlying philosophy that um, and, and this comes from my 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 faith. Um, anything that's not for me, I don't want. So for whatever reason, it, it wasn't my time. I, I thought it was for whatever, whatever reason it, it wasn't. Um, and I don't know what was down that road in this four year term that 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 wasn't for me. But if it wasn't for me, I don't want it. And, and my my core priority is my family. Um, and so, you know, I came out of the uh, a difficult campaign with my family intact. In fact, I asked my wife at the end, I said, what could I have done better during the campaign to, to make sure I'm present uh, as possible for the family? And, and my wife said she thought I did a pretty good job, uh, you know, certainly a, a lot of work on her, but she felt like I was focused on maintaining uh, my role as a husband and a dad. And, and so uh, having run a campaign with my integrity intact, with my family intact, uh, you know, that's, I can't ask for a lot more in, in fairness. I, I wanted a little bit more, but uh, but but in fairness, I couldn't ask for a lot more. So um, so so those have helped me deal with it. But also using opportunities, I've I've fallen down a lot of times in life, and I always use those opportunities to learn more, to get better, to get stronger. And so even losing a campaign, there are substantial opportunities to learn uh, what I need to do better, not just in campaigning, but much more importantly in my role as a council member. Yeah, and it's a critical skill uh, in life to figure out how to make sure a disappointment doesn't turn into a depression. Yeah, yeah. Because I think for many, for many, that can can too easily happen. Yeah, and and you have to be attentive to it. You know, I I, I think you know not just the day after uh, in not winning a campaign, but the week after, the month after, uh, to to check in with yourself. I check in with with my wife as well, you know, just, just to make sure nothing is sort of under the surface that, that I'm not seeing. So it was a tough loss. Uh, you know, it, 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 it did have an impact on me. Uh, but, but certainly, I, I, you know, I know what it is to, to kind of fall down and get back up and, and be better off for it. Uh, and I'll never forget an, an important lesson I learned in life. When I ran my first campaign, and, and you probably know this from previous conversations, I quit my job on Capitol Hill with, with Congresswoman Norton with, with no backup plan, no parachute, uh, not a lot in savings, just really jumping out on faith in something that I believe uh, I was uh, supposed to do. Uh, and when I didn't win that campaign, I, I found a couple things. One, several job offers that were uh, improvements on the job that I had left, but also an opportunity to run again two years later to be much better, much stronger uh, and, and to win. And so, so that experience experience in my life was an important lesson uh, that just because you don't succeed at one time doesn't mean that you won't succeed in the long run and at the right time. And, you know, you're, you're, I think the, you've alluded to this, I think your family, your wife and your kids need to be resilient because you already have a job that takes you away from them 
yeah. a great deal. So you're already asking a lot of them on that front. Then you're like double or nothing. I'm going to do the second job for, you know, a year or whatever. Um, and then when you don't win, yeah. you know, I, I used to be head of my co-op uh, board. And when I stopped doing that voluntarily, my daughter was bummed. Yeah. She was seriously bummed for a week or two, you know, and that was, I was not throwing my whole life into that. And it was me who made the decision. Yeah. you know so how how you know particularly with the kids and if this is too personal you don't need to no no it, too it's, much. It's, but that just i would just think that'd be the hardest thing it, it is a great question and it is something that i think a lot of people don't fully appreciate you know my daughter is uh my, my oldest madison uh just turned uh six so she was five <clears throat> at the end of the election uh my youngest is is three monroe um and I think they they like I f expected that I would win and and there was a, a disappointment um for them and 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 it was it was tough for them. I also think it was an important opportunity for them to understand a couple uh lessons. One, you you've got to work your butt off at everything if if you believe it is important and important to you, you've got to work your, your, your butt off, uh, but also uh, that you have to be gracious in, in defeat and you have to get back up. Um, and so those weren't lessons that I expected to instill in them at uh, three and five years old, but but there are always lessons. And 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 I think losing the, the campaign was harder, particularly on my oldest daughter, Madison, uh, than, than it was on, on me. Uh, you know, I told her at one point during the campaign, I said, you know, there's a chance dad won't, won't win. And um, and if it's not meant to be, that's OK. And essentially, she told me I better get out there and work harder because she she did, she didn't expect me to lose. So, uh, so it is, probably was an important lesson for her as well. Yeah, no, that's true. That is true. Um, now, uh, now let's pivot kind of from from personal uh, physical and mental health to uh, the mental health of the district. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like it is about as bad as I can remember the collective yeah. mental health here in, uh, in DC. Uh, what, what is your take on where people are mentally? And is there any hope for what we can do about it? Uh, there, there, there is hope in there. I think there has to be hope. Um, what, what I see in this, this city uh, is a city in, in a lot of pain, uh, particularly people uh, who have, have been in more difficult uh, financial, living, educational situations uh, for, for a long time. I think a lot is, is coming to a head, and, and that's a place that we really have to focus. I think it, it, when we think about a city that uh, is safer because we are not in a good place uh, right now, the level of crime is just rising so much it feels in so many ways like it did in the 80s and 90s. Uh, I, I just I know that police are part of uh, our public safety response, but unless we address the mental health aspects, the, the, the living and poverty aspects, we're going to continue in this cycle for a while and we're going to see the cycle return. So, so seeing what's happening in the city makes me positive that the executive branch, the legislative branch, private sectors, nonprofits really have to come together uh, around a comprehensive public safety plan that really centers mental health because that, that is a huge unmet need in our city and, and in cities and, and counties across the nation. I, I feel, I mean, not to, to uh, psychoanalyze people, but I feel like nationwide, um, it's no secret DC was not a fan of the prior president. Folks felt like, oh, if we can just survive this presidency, things will get better. And then when COVID was so terrible simultaneously, folks were like, if we can just get through this pandemic, things will be better. And now we're mostly through one and mostly through the other. And I don't think folks feel like it got better and we don't have that next when it dot, 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 it mm -hmm. will get better. And I think that's why people are struggling, at least with the two bad things we were facing previously, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Now we just feel like it's a tunnel. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what we do to get past that, how we create that light. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's a, a profound point. And, and I think what, what underlies that point is, unfortunately, what we were seeing before as the light at the end of the tunnel was a presidency that was not as terrible and demeaning to people uh, in a time where we weren't seeing so much loss from COVID. But, but those aren't really lights. Those are just a return to normalcy. And, uh, and I, normal just feels so different now. And, you know, we took so much negativity in during the Trump presidency and during uh, the, 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 the worst days of, of COVID. Uh, and to, to your point, it's hard for people to say we have something to look forward to. So the end of a terrible thing isn't a great thing to look forward to. Now people really need something real positive and, and as tangible as possible to, to look forward to. And, and, and most people are struggling to find that. And you already focused in on public safety. Uh, it just, some of it feels unrelenting. I mean, you just put the, the news is always depressing, but it yeah. just seems like recently, I mean, so many innocent folks shot and killed, uh, bystander, the uh, crime um, victims, uh, the Washington Commanders player getting shot during a carjacking. It's mm -hmm. just unrelenting and just seeing the suffering in the families of those that have lost people yeah. is just gutting. Um, and I don't, I don't feel like we see a clear answer. When, yeah. when you have half the city that thinks the police are the problem and half the people think the police are the solution, I, I don't know how you do it. How do you, as a council member, reconcile those two worlds that are just opposite, disparate worldviews? Yeah, I, I think what is important for us getting to the other side of uh, a dark time um, and also necessary for us to actually find solutions is, is that we have to start listening to each other more. And, and so I, I don't hear uh, half of the city saying that police uh, are, are the problem. I hear half the city saying, I, I see hear the entire city saying we want to feel safe. And some people, because of lived experiences, uh, don't feel more safe uh, because of police. But it's, it's not police uh, per se. It is how we police. And so I, I think there are people not saying, there are not a lot of people saying they don't want police. There are a lot of people saying we want policing to look different and, and feel different. And I think that is a very fair thing. If we understand why people are saying that and feeling that way, uh, I think that it's a very fair sentiment. There are other people saying, look, the, the only real tool we feel like we have and to, to, to keep us safe is police. And so they're saying we want to feel safe and police are going to make us feel more safe. At the end of the day, all these folks are saying they want to feel more safe. And, and our job as, as the government is really to, to help find that path forward, to, to make people safe, to help people feel more safe. Uh, I think that requires police, but I also think it requires a change in, in how we police. And do you have legitimate hope that in the short or medium term, we'll be able to do, to find the best of each of the components of a proper public safety response that will be able to take the good from policing, the good from violence interruption, uh, find that mental health uh, piece that, that you said was so important. D do you see that coming together? Uh, I, I think it has to. Um, what, what I don't want to see is um, a, a sort of a, a full return to how we try to address crime in the 80s and, and 90s in a way that kicks the can down the road. So we can just arrest and prosecute people sort of as, as fast and aggressively as, as we can. But that's not going to fix the underlying mental health issue. That's not going to fix the underlying poverty issue, education and inequality, uh, income inequality. Those are issues that we have to address as we sort of police and prosecute uh, in a productive way. But if we don't address those underlying issues, we're going to find ourselves right back in the same place as, as we continue to do. And sort of rotating back to the life of a council member again, how do you, because I couldn't, deal with the funerals, the interactions with family members of victims? I, I mean, I'm watching it secondhand on the news and crying, and you're, I mean, you have people, I'm sure, screaming at you at times, people weeping, um, and you're just going to funerals constantly for tragedies of 
and you are such a family man, you know, so you feel it as much as anyone can. How do you psychologically deal with that? Uh, it, it is difficult. Um, and um, particularly when the, the people being lost to gun violence are, are young people and, and I have to talk to their parents or, or see their young kids, uh, it, it strikes a particularly difficult uh, chord for me. Uh, but, but I also know that they deserve and the, the city deserves for us to continue to improve. And so uh, with, with these tra tragedies, I, I really try to, to use them to, to push me to, to do more, to continue to focus on, on the issue. Uh, and it is, it, it, this, the job that I have is, is one that I consider a, a blessing and a privilege. Uh, but one of the things that comes with it is, is needing to, to talk to people in times where they need comfort or frankly, someone to, to, to yell at. And, uh, and that comes with the territory. So, so I do accept it as part of my job. Do you ever speak to other council members about this, about the, again, the, the true burden is on the victims and their families, but the fact that so much of this comes back on you and that you all are pulled in, uh, attend against so many funerals. Um, do you do ever discuss that among council members, the, the, comp, the difficulty of that? I, I don't. I don't think I have in a in a in a real way. I I know that they're facing the the same thing that 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 I'm facing, uh, but and so I I haven't spoken to to my colleagues. But it might be a, a conversation that's that's overdue because there is a it, it is a difficult uh, circumstance to 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 deal with, and and none of us are are trained in sort of you know that type of of care and and response that uh, that 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 these situations do often require. And, uh, and what, as, as so often is the case with healthcare, there's a real equity divide in uh, mental health care, mental health services, and even comfort in declaring a need or a legitimacy for mental health care. Do you have any thoughts on how to, how to bridge that gap and make uh, mental health care more readily available across the, the demographic spectrum? Well, one of the... Yeah, silver linings of the pandemic is that it has pushed us as as a nation to talk more about and think more about mental health and mental health care. And so uh, these conversations are much more frequent, much more open, much more public than they were just a couple of years ago. Uh, I think that puts pressure on our providers to expand the, the level of care. And so we have seen some response from the federal government in creating a, a line similar to sort of 911 that people can call if they find themselves in mental health crisis. There's been an increased focus on mental health supports in schools, and my office has has really increased our focus on on the mental health uh, of of students, but also of uh, unclogging the the pipeline, the mental health pipeline, uh, be, because I think that in the coming years there will be a lot more mental health resources. And so between pushing our providers, pushing governments to create more um, uh, resources for for mental health supports, I, I think these are are moving us in the right direction. But that, just to push back a bit, that's all supply side. I mean, that's not demand side. I think the people in the district that need mental health care the most would never in a million years ask for it. No, it was okay to ask for it. They don't, know, they don't think they know anyone else who's taking advantage of those services, who relies on them. How do we make it, how do we let folks know that everyone is a consumer of this, that it's okay to do, that it doesn't mean you're crazy, mm -hmm. um, that it maybe is what's keeping you from becoming crazy is yeah. having access to these services. How do we, how do we deal with the demand side? Well, I, I think across the equity gap. I think we talk about it. And so um, that's one of the reasons that my, uh, you know, being in, in, in therapy for me, is a private thing. Uh, I now talk about it uh, out of a, a sense of responsibility to, to make this a more normal conversation. Uh, and I, I, I hear more public conversations about therapy, about mental health. And so I, I do think it is rapidly uh, becoming the norm and becoming uh, accepted across communities in a way that it wasn't even a couple of years ago. So, so I do think that we 
we are impacting the demand side. Uh, and, that, and I think that part of what we have to do is to continue to talk about it and, and talk about it openly. And also, I think technology is helping a lot that it, it's, you know, there was this stereotypical going to an office and laying yeah. on a couch. And now the fact that it's available by text, by video call, yeah. um, you know, in little brief uh, uh, amounts, not necessarily a whole hour set aside or something like that. Yeah, I think that will help a lot. As well. I, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Telehealth is another thing that I've I've loved seeing sort of progress rapidly in the, in the past uh, year for physical health and, and for mental health. Uh, and let's let's speak a bit about physical health in the district. Uh, COVID is in this weird phase where it's still a deadly pandemic, but it's a less deadly pandemic and folks are getting it if they're vaccinated or not. Um, uh, where do we go from here? It, you know, it was when it was scary in the early months, I, again, from a mental health standpoint, it was easier because it's like, wow, there's this scary thing we have to fight. Now it's like this scary-ish thing that we yeah. still need to take seriously and we might need to take seriously forever. So where, where are we from a physical health standpoint um, in the district? Now, I, I think we're, we, we are still in, in, in the in-between phase. We, we are learning how to live uh, with a, a, a virus that is going to be with us uh, likely the rest of our, our lives um, and, and understanding what that balance is between living our lives, but also keeping ourselves and others safe. What, what we shouldn't lose sight of is that COVID impacts people differently. Uh, I have a very close family member of mine who's dealing with, with long COVID as several people across the world are. You know, it can cause permanent or seemingly permanent, semi-permanent uh, respiratory issues, uh, uh, mental uh, issues, physical issues, and, and it just affects us all differently. And sometimes it's the first time someone gets COVID, sometimes it's the third time someone gets COVID that it has that, that level of impact. So we have to continue to, to be careful, but we, we also have to, we, we, we can't be sort of, you know, stuck in our, our homes for the rest of our lives. So, so it is a balance. And, and I think it's how we balance it is going to continue to evolve year after year. Uh, but, uh, but, but it's something that we all have to figure out how to live with in, in our own individual way. I frequently find myself in parts of the country where I'm, I'm going places and I'm the only person visible with a mask on. And that's all right with me. I hope it's all right with them. I'm not judging them. They, they shouldn't judge me, but you know, we have to give everybody uh, sort of their, their space and autonomy to, to figure out how to deal with this virus and, and keep living their lives. And despite uh, the council's uh, sort of fierce efforts to break out COVID uh, data, COVID services, and now again with monkeypox, to break that out demographically and by ward, uh, there are still uh, big equity disparities. Uh, uh, again, what, what can we do? I, I feel like the council uh, worked very hard uh, uphill to shine a light on that and to point out that it was true and make sure that clinics were where people were dying. Yeah. Um, not just where the demand was necessarily, but how do we, um, what more can we do to, to try to write that balance? Uh, it, it, it goes back to, to what I was talking about with, with public safety. It is listening to people. You, you will not be able to cram uh, vaccine down people's throats. That there is a reason why people of color, particularly African-Americans, are, are less trustful of vaccines and the government. Uh, and unless and until we really, uh, in an authentic way, confront and deal with that, I think we're gonna continue to, to struggle. And so, you know, us kind of, you know, wagging our fingers saying, you need to get vaccinated, do it for yourself, do it for other people. It's not gonna take us very far, but asking people, why, why is it that you don't trust the vaccine? Why is it that you don't trust the government? Really digging into those, those issues in a way that is respectful of where people are and how they got there. I think that's how we start to uh, unwind that, that distrust and get to the deeper issues. And, and the other piece, and, and I think uh, the, the administration and, and DC government have done a, a good job of this, is really working with and working through trusted community uh, entities and people, uh, because often, you know, we, and this is how we have evolved over years, there, there are people that, that we see as sort of 
trustworthy among our community. And if they are doing something, we are more likely to do it. And so continuing to, to identify and work with uh, trusted community people and pillars and organizations uh, as a way to, to create more equity in the vaccine uptake for COVID, for monkeypox, uh, that, that moves us forward as well. And have you had success personally persuading people on be the can be the vaccine can be mental health services can be some other health services have you have you had luck convincing people as one of those trusted members of the community uh, to, to change their ways I, 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 I have not positioned myself to, to try to convince people. Uh, what I have tried to do is identify the, the people who have that broad community trust. And so, or I, I should say, I don't know if I've convinced people. I, I've talked about sort of my feelings about the vaccine. Uh, I've been very public when I got vaccinated, when my family got vaccinated to, to help sort of encourage and, and motivate. Uh, I have not tried to change people's minds, but I've tried uh, to, to to, to identify and get resources to uh, those folks who, who really do uh, change minds. Okay, we're running short on time, but as we're getting ready for the council to uh, reconvene after recess, are, do you have any legislative priorities in mind that pull together some of these mental health or physical health priorities we've talked about? Uh, two, two major priorities are, are, are exactly this. One, one is mental health. And, and so one of the things I'm working on uh, is to uh, expand the pipeline of mental health professionals. Now there is more demand for mental health assistance than there are practitioners. Uh, and so my office and, and shout out to my legislative director, Katie Whitehouse, we have been working with the University of the District of Columbia in an attempt to create uh, a, a free tuition for any DC resident who has a bachelor's degree to go and get a master's in uh, counseling or a master's in social work so that we can expand the, the pipeline. And once we uh, get this done at the University of the District of Columbia, it's something I hope will expand to, to other universities uh, and, uh, and continuing to pay attention to mental health uh, in our school. So that's a big place that, that we're focusing uh, in the fall and going forward. Uh, the, the other place is on public safety, uh, but, but public safety requires a focus on education, uh, on employment, uh, or on, um, um, on um, housing. And so really focusing on public, uh, public safety through those avenues is, is where we believe that we can make the most impact in the fall and going forward uh, based on where our, our city is right now. And from the practitioner standpoint, I think uh, another important benefit of what you're trying to do is, I, I don't I assume there've been studies on this. I assume folks like practitioners that look like them, that they feel comfortable with. Um, and it seems like you, that program would, would draw a diverse okay. uh, participant pool so that more folks could feel comfortable with the people there uh, right. confiding in and entrusting their, their mental health. In. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the number of people uh, of color I've spoken to over the past year who said that they have struggled to find uh, a mental health practitioner of color, uh, you know, is, is not surprising, but it also is, is a call to action. Absolutely. Um, well, God, this was exhausting. Um, we, <laughs> nor we, normally have, we normally have more fun in these talks, but I feel like this is critical stuff. So, uh, we're out of time, uh, but I appreciate you taking the time and, and uh, digging deep with me uh, for this stuff. I appreciate it, Josh. Thanks for doing this. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Uh, and I will just remind our listeners, remember to subscribe to our podcast on SoundCloud or wherever you get your podcast. Just search under Hearing the Council. Thanks again for joining listen, uh, listeners. Tune in next time. We're on DC Radio at 96.3 on your FM HD4 dial or at dcradio.gov. I'm Josh Gibson, and this is not a council hearing. This is Hearing the Council. Thanks again, council member. Take care. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.